The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume One by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume One by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section Nine. Second Book, Part Two. The New Paris, Part Three. Still, these spiteful words inoculated me with a sort of moral disease which crept on in secret. It would not have displeased me at all to have been the grandson of any person of consideration, even if it had not been in the most lawful way. My acuteness followed up the scent. My imagination was excited and my sagacity put in requisition. I began to investigate the allegation, and invented or found for it new grounds of probability. I had heard little said of my grandfather, except that his likeness, together with my grandmother's, had hung in a parlour of the old house, both of which, after the building of the new one, had been kept in an upper chamber. My grandmother must have been a very handsome woman, and of the same age as her husband. I remembered so to have seen in her room the miniature of a handsome gentleman in uniform with star and order, which after her death and during the confusion of house-building had disappeared with many other small pieces of furniture. These, and many other things, I put together in my childish head, and exercised that modern poetical talent which contrives to obtain the sympathies of the whole cultivated world by a marvellous combination of the important events of human life. But as I did not venture to trust such an affair to any one, or even to ask the most remote questions concerning it, I was not wanting in a secret diligence in order to get, if possible, somewhat nearer to the matter. I had heard it explicitly maintained that sons often bore a decided resemblance to their fathers or grandfathers. Many of our friends, especially Councillor Schneider, a friend of the family, were connected by business with all the princes and noblemen of the neighbourhood of whom including both the ruling and the younger branches, not a few had estates on the Rhine and Main, and in the intermediate country, and who at times honoured their faithful agents with their portraits. These, which I had often seen on the walls from my infancy, I now regarded with redoubled attention, seeking whether I could not detect some resemblance to my father, or even to myself, which too often happened to lead me to any degree of certainty, for now it was the eyes of this, now the nose of that, which seemed to indicate some relationship. Thus these marks led me delusively backward and forward, and though in the end I was compelled to regard the reproach as a completely empty tale, the impression remained, and I could not from time to time refrain from privately calling up and testing all the noblemen whose images had remained very distinct in my imagination. So true is it that whatever inwardly confirms man in his self-conceit or flatters his secret vanity is so highly desirable to him that he does not ask further whether in other respects it may turn to his honour or disgrace. But instead of mingling here serious and even reproachful reflections, I rather turn my look away from those beautiful times, for who is able to speak worthily of the fullness of childhood? We cannot behold the little creatures which flit about before us otherwise than with delight, nay, with admiration, for they generally promise more than they perform. And it seems that nature, 
among the other roguish tricks that she plays us here also especially designs to make sport of us the first organs she bestows upon children coming into the world are adapted to the nearest immediate condition of the creature which unassuming and artless makes use of them in the readiest way for its present purposes the child considered in and for himself with his equals and in relations suited to his powers seems so intelligent and rational and at the same time so easy cheerful and clever that one can hardly wish it further cultivation if children grew up according to early indications we should have nothing but geniuses but growth is not merely development the various organic systems which constitute one man spring one from another follow each other change into each other supplant each other and even consume each other so that after a time scarcely a trace is to be found of many aptitudes and manifestations of ability even when the talents of the man have on the whole a decided direction it will be hard for the greatest and most experienced connoisseur to declare them beforehand with confidence although afterwards it is easy to remark what has pointed to a future by no means therefore is it my design wholly to comprise the stories of my childhood in these first books but i will rather afterwards resume and continue many a thread which ran through the early years unnoticed here however i must remark what an increasing influence the incidents of the war gradually exercised upon our sentiments and mode of life the peaceful citizen stands in a wonderful relation to the great events of the world they already excite and disquiet him from a distance and even if they do not touch him he can scarcely refrain from an opinion and a sympathy soon he takes a side as his character or external circumstances may determine but when such grand fatalities such important changes draw nearer to him then with many outward inconveniences remains that inward discomfort which doubles and sharpens the evil and destroys the good which is still possible then he has really to suffer from friends and foes often more from the former than from the latter and he knows not how to secure and preserve either his interests or his inclinations the year seventeen fifty seven which still passed in perfectly civic tranquillity kept us nevertheless in great uneasiness of mind perhaps no other was more fruitful of events than this conquests achievements misfortunes restorations followed one upon another swallowed up and seemed to destroy each other yet the image of frederick his name and glory soon hovered again above all the enthusiasm of his worshippers grew always stronger and more animated the hatred of his enemies more bitter and the diversity of opinion which separated even families contributed not a little to isolate citizens already sundered in many ways and on other grounds for in a city like frankfurt where three religions divide the inhabitants into three unequal masses where only a few men even of the ruling faith can attain to political power there must be many wealthy and educated persons who are thrown back upon themselves and by means of studies and tastes form for themselves an individual and secluded existence it will be necessary for us to speak of such men now and hereafter if we are to bring before us the peculiarities of a frankfurt citizen of that time my father immediately after his return from his travels had in his own way formed the design that 
to prepare himself for the service of the city he would undertake one of the subordinate offices and discharge its duties without emolument if it were conferred upon him without balloting in the consciousness of his good intentions and according to his way of thinking and the conception he had of himself he believed that he deserved such a distinction which indeed was not conformable to law or precedent consequently when his suit was rejected he fell into ill humour and disgust vowed that he would never accept of any place and in order to render it impossible procured the title of imperial councillor which the schultheiss and elder schoffen bear as a special honour he thus made himself an equal of the highest and could not begin again at the bottom the same impulse induced him also to woo the eldest daughter of the schultheiss so that he was excluded from the council on this side also he was now of that number of recluses who never form themselves into a society they are as much isolated in respect to each other as they are in regard to the whole and the more so as in this seclusion the character becomes more and more uncouth my father in his travels and in the world which he had seen might have formed some conception of a more elegant and liberal mode of life than was perhaps common among his fellow-citizens in this respect however he was not entirely without predecessors and associates the name of uffenbach is well known at that time there was a chef von uffenbach who was generally respected he had been in italy had applied himself particularly to music sang an agreeable tenor and having brought home a fine collection of pieces concerts and oratorios were performed at his house now as he sang in these himself and held musicians in great favour it was not thought altogether suitable to his dignity and his invited guests as well as the other people of the country allowed themselves many a jocose remark on the matter i remember too a baron von hackel a rich nobleman who being married but childless occupied a charming house in the antonia street fitted up with all the appurtenances of a dignified position in life he also possessed good pictures engravings antiques and much else which generally accumulates with collectors and lovers of art from time to time he asked the more noted personages to dinner and was beneficent in a careful way of his own since he clothed the poor in his own house but kept back their old rags and gave them a weekly charity on condition that they should present themselves every time clean and neat in the clothes bestowed on them i can recall him but indistinctly as a genial well-made man but more clearly his auction which i attended from beginning to end and partly by command of my father partly from my own impulse purchased many things that are still to be found in my collections at an earlier date than this so early that i scarcely set eyes upon him john michael von lohen gained considerable repute in the literary world as well as at frankfurt not a native of frankfurt he settled there and married a sister of my grandmother textor whose maiden name was lindheim familiar with the court and political world and rejoicing in a renewed title of nobility he had acquired reputation by daring to take part in the various excitements which arose in church and state he wrote the count of rivera a didactic romance the subject of which is made apparent by the second title or the honest man at court this work was well received because it insisted on morality even in courts 
where prudence only is generally at home and thus his labour brought him applause and respect a second work for that very reason would be accompanied by more danger he wrote the only true religion a book designed to advance tolerance especially between lutherans and calvinists but here he got into a controversy with the theologians one dr benner of giessen in particular wrote against him von lohen rejoined the contest grew violent and personal and the unpleasantness which arose from it caused him to accept the office of president at lingen which frederick the second offered him supposing that he was an enlightened unprejudiced man and not averse to the new views that more extensively obtained in france his former countryman whom he had left in some displeasure averred that he was not contented there nay could not be so as a place like lingen was not to be compared with frankfurt my father also doubted whether the president would be happy and asserted that the good uncle would have done better not to connect himself with the king as it was generally hazardous to get too near him extraordinary sovereign as he undoubtedly was for it had been seen how disgracefully the famous voltaire had been arrested in frankfurt at the requisition of the prussian resident freytag though he had formerly stood so high in favour and had been regarded as the king's teacher in french poetry there was on such occasions no want of reflections and examples to warn one against courts and princes service of which a native frankfurter could scarcely form a conception an excellent man dr ort i will only mention by name because here i have not so much to erect a monument to the deserving citizens of frankfurt but rather refer to them only in so far as their renown or personal character had some influence upon me in my earliest years dr ort was a wealthy man and was also of that number who never took part in the government although perfectly qualified to do so by his knowledge and penetration the antiquities of germany and more especially of frankfurt had been much indebted to him he published remarks on the so-called reformation of frankfurt a work in which the statutes of the state are collected the historical portions of this book i diligently read in my youth von ochsenstein the eldest of the three brothers whom i have mentioned above as our neighbours had not been remarkable during his lifetime in consequence of his recluse habits but became the more remarkable after his death by leaving behind him a direction that common working men should carry him to the grave early in the morning in perfect silence and without an attendant or follower this was done and the affair caused great excitement in the city where they were accustomed to the most pompous funerals all who discharged the customary offices on such occasions rose against the innovation but the stout patrician found imitators in all classes and though such ceremonies were derisively called ox burials in square brackets footnote a pun upon the name of ochenstein translator they came into fashion to the advantage of many of the more poorly provided families while funeral parades were less and less in vogue i bring forward this circumstance because it presents one of the earlier symptoms of that tendency to humility and equality which in the second half of the last century was manifested in so many ways from above downward and broke out in such unlooked-for effects nor was there any lack of antiquarian amateurs 
there were cabinets of pictures collections of engravings while the curiosities of our own country especially were zealously sought and hoarded the older decrees and mandates of the imperial city of which no collection had been prepared were carefully searched for in print and manuscript arranged in the order of time and preserved with reverence as a treasure of native laws and customs the portraits of frankfurters which existed in great number were also brought together and formed a special department of the cabinets such men my father appears generally to have taken as his models he was wanting in none of the qualities that pertain to an upright and respectable citizen thus after he had built his house he put his property of every sort into order an excellent collection of maps by schenk and other geographers at that time eminent the aforesaid decrees and mandates the portraits a chest of ancient weapons a case of remarkable venetian glasses cups and goblets natural curiosities works in ivory bronzes and a hundred other things were separated and displayed and i did not fail whenever an auction occurred to get some commission for the increase of his possessions i must still speak of one important family of which i had heard strange things since my earliest years and of some of whose members i myself lived to see a great deal that was wonderful i mean the zinkenbergs the father of whom i have little to say was an opulent man he had three sons who even in their youth uniformly distinguished themselves as oddities such things are not well received in a limited city where no one is suffered to render himself conspicuous either for good or evil nicknames and odd stories long kept in memory are generally the fruit of such singularity the father lived at the corner of hare street hasengasse which took its name from a sign on the house that represented one hare at least if not three hares they consequently called these three brothers only the three hares which nickname they could not shake off for a long time but as great endowments often announce themselves in youth in the form of singularity and awkwardness so it was also in this case the eldest of the brothers was the reichshofrat imperial councillor von senkenberg afterwards so celebrated the second was admitted into the magistracy and displayed eminent abilities which however he subsequently abused in a pettifogging and even infamous way if not to the injury of his native city certainly to that of his colleagues the third brother a physician and man of great integrity but who practised little and that only in high families preserved even in his old age a somewhat whimsical exterior he was always very neatly dressed and was never seen in the street otherwise than in shoes and stockings with a well-powdered curled wig and his hat under his arm he walked on rapidly but with a singular sort of stagger so that he was sometimes on one and sometimes on the other side of the way and formed a complete zigzag as he went the wags said that he made this irregular step to get out of the way of the departed souls who might follow him in a straight line and that he imitated those who are afraid of a crocodile but all these jests and many merry sayings were transformed at last into respect for him when he devoted his handsome dwelling-house in eschenheim street with court garden and all other appurtenances to a medical establishment where in addition to a hospital designed exclusively for the citizens of frankfurt a botanic garden an anatomical theatre a chemical laboratory a considerable library 
and a house for the director were instituted in a way of which no university need have been ashamed. Another eminent man, whose efficiency in the neighbourhood and whose writings, rather than his presence, had a very important influence upon me, was Charles Frederick von Moser, who was perpetually referred to in our district for his activity in business. He also had a character essentially moral, which, as the vices of human nature frequently gave him trouble, inclined him to the so-called pious. Thus, what von Lohen had tried to do in respect to court life, he would have done for business life, introducing into it a more conscientious mode of proceeding. The great number of small German courts gave rise to a multitude of princes and servants, the former of whom desired unconditional obedience, while the latter, for the most part, would work or serve only according to their own convictions. Thus arose an endless conflict and rapid changes and explosions, because the effects of an unrestricted course of proceeding become much sooner noticeable and injurious on a small scale than on a large one. Many families were in debt, and imperial commissions of debts were appointed. Others found themselves sooner or later on the same road, while the officers either reaped an unconscionable profit, or conscientiously made themselves disagreeable and odious. Moser wished to act as a statesman and man of business, and here his hereditary talent, cultivated to a profession, gave him a decided advantage. But he at the same time wished to act as a man and a citizen, and surrender as little as possible of his moral dignity. His prince and servant, his Daniel in the lion's den, his relics, paint throughout his own condition, in which he felt himself not indeed tortured, but always cramped. They all indicate impatience, in a condition to the bearings of which one cannot reconcile oneself, yet from which one cannot get free. With this mode of thinking and feeling he was indeed often compelled to seek other employments, which, on account of his great cleverness, were never wanting. I remember him as a pleasing, active, and at the same time gentle man. The name of Klopstock had already produced a great effect upon us, even at a distance. In the outset, people wondered how so excellent a man could be so strangely named. But they soon got accustomed to this, and thought no more of the meaning of the syllables. In my father's library I had hitherto found only the earlier poets, especially those who in his day had gradually appeared and acquired fame. All these had written in rhyme, and my father held rhyme as indispensable in poetical works. Karnitz, Hagedorn, Dollinger, Gellert, Kreutz, Haller stood in a row in handsome calf bindings. To these were added Neukirch's Telemachus, Coppin's Jerusalem Delivered, and other translations. I had, from my childhood, diligently perused the whole of these works, and committed portions of them to memory, whence I was often called upon to amuse the company. A vexatious era, on the other hand, opened upon my father when, through Klopstock's Messiah, verses which seemed to him no verses became an object of public admiration. In square brackets, footnote, the Messiah is written in hexameter verse translator. He had taken good care not to buy this book, but the friend of the family, Councillor Schneider, 
smuggled it in and slipped it into the hands of my mother and her children on this man of business who read but little the messiah as soon as it appeared made a powerful impression those pious feelings so naturally expressed and yet so beautifully elevated that pleasant diction even if considered merely as harmonious prose had so won the otherwise dry man of business that he regarded the first ten cantos of which alone we are properly speaking as the finest book of devotion and once every year in passion week when he managed to escape from business read it quietly through by himself and thus refreshed himself for the entire year in the beginning he thought to communicate his emotions to his old friend but he was much shocked when forced to perceive an incurable dislike cherished against a book of such valuable substance merely because of what appeared to him an indifferent external form it may readily be supposed that their conversation often reverted to this topic but both parties diverged more and more widely from each other there were violent scenes and the compliant man was at last pleased to be silent on his favourite work that he might not lose at the same time a friend of his youth and a good sunday meal it is the most natural wish of every man to make proselytes and how much did our friend find himself rewarded in secret when he discovered in the rest of the family hearts so openly disposed for his saint the copy which he used only one week during the year was given over to our edification all the remaining time my mother kept it secret and we children took possession of it when we could that in leisure hours hidden in some nook we might learn the most striking passages by heart and particularly might impress the most tender as well as the most violent parts on our memory as quickly as possible portia's dream we recited in a sort of rivalry and divided between us the wild dialogue of despair between satan and andromelech who have been cast into the red sea the first part as the strongest had been assigned to me and the second as a little more pathetic was undertaken by my sister the alternate and horrible but well-sounding curses flowed only thus from our mouths and we seized every opportunity to accost each other with these infernal phrases one saturday evening in winter my father always had himself shaved overnight that on sunday morning he might dress for church at his ease we sat on a footstool behind the stove and muttered our customary imprecations in a tolerably low voice while the barber was putting on the lather but now a drumlick had to lay his iron hands on satan my sister seized me with violence and recited softly enough but with increasing passion give me thine aid i entreat thee i'll worship thee if thou demandest thee thou reprobate monster yes thee of all criminals blackest aid me i suffer the tortures of death everlasting avenging once in the times gone by i with furious hatred could hate thee now i can hate thee no more e'en this is the sharpest of tortures thus far all went on tolerably but loudly with a dreadful voice she cried the following words oh how utterly crushed i am now the good surgeon was startled and emptied the lather basin into my father's bosom there was a great uproar and a severe investigation was held especially with respect to the mischief which might have been done if the shaving had been actually going forward in order to relieve ourselves of all suspicions of mischievousness we pleaded guilty of having acted these satanic characters and the misfortune occasioned by the hexameters was so apparent 
that they were again condemned and banished. Thus children and common people are accustomed to transform the great and the sublime into a sport and even a farce. And how indeed could they otherwise abide and endure it? End of section 9